My sermon today is called Signs, Wonders, and Miracles, and I invite you to listen for that as you hear some selections from the second chapter of the book of Acts. Acts, as you know, is also called the Acts of the Apostles, and it is perhaps the most exciting and dramatic book in the whole Bible. Listen for the word of God. Fellow Israelites, listen carefully to these words. Now, this is Peter who's preaching. Jesus the Nazarene, a man thoroughly accredited by God to you, the miracles and wonders and signs that God did through him are common knowledge. This Jesus, following the deliberate and well thought out plan of God, was betrayed by men who took the law into their own hands and was handed over to you. You meaning this large crowd that he's preaching to. And you pinned him to a cross and killed him. But God untied the death ropes and raised him up. Death was no match for him. This Jesus God raised up, and every one of us here is a witness to it. Then raised to the heights at the right hand of God and receiving the promise of the Holy Spirit from the Father, he poured out the Spirit he had just received. That is what you see and hear today. All Israel know this. There is no longer room for doubt. God made Jesus Master and Messiah, this Jesus whom you killed on a cross. Now talk about some preaching, right? And here's the response. Cut to the quick. Those who were there listening asked Peter and the other apostles, brothers, brothers, what should we do now? Peter said, change your life. Turn to God and be baptized, each of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins are forgiven. Receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise, this promise, is targeted to you and your children but also to all who are far away, and we would be part of that far away, whomever, in fact, our master God invites. Peter went on in this vein for a long time, urging them over and over, get out while you can. Get out of this sick and stupid culture. This is the message version. That day, about 3,000 took him at his word and were baptized and signed up. They committed themselves to the teaching of the apostles, the life together, the common meal, and the prayers. Everyone around was in awe. All those wonders and signs done through the apostles, and all the believers lived in a wonderful harmony, holding everything in common. They sold whatever they owned and pooled their resources so that each person's need was met. They followed a daily discipline of worship in the temple, followed by meals at home, every meal a celebration, exuberant and joyful as they praised God. People in general liked what they saw. Every day, their number grew as God added to those who were saved. Here ends our scripture reading for today. During college, I had a summer job as a receptionist in a civil engineering office. One of the engineers there invited me to go to an AA meeting where she was going to speak. I knew she walked with a limp, but I learned that night at the meeting that she had a wooden leg as a result of a bar fight, which evolved into a drunken motorcycle chase and a severe accident, and to quitting alcohol. I was so moved by her story and the AA meeting that when a basket was passed around for donations to pay for the coffee, I held the basket for a minute or two, debating with myself. I had a $10 bill and two ones in my wallet. I pulled out the two ones, but I just couldn't put them in the basket. I had designated that $10 bill to splurge on a special shampoo, but somewhat reluctantly, I felt compelled to put that 10 into the basket. The very next morning, walking the 45 minutes to work with my friend, I noticed a small green piece of paper folded up on the ground. I picked it up, 
unfolded it, and lo and behold, it was a $10 bill. I looked around. There was no house nearby. There was no store. There was nobody looking for money. So I pocketed it with delight. Well, it was only a little bit later that I put two and two together, and then, you know, it's kind of like your hair stands on end. Oh, my gosh. This is a wonder. This is a wonder when I put it together with the night before. I took it as a sign of God having noticed some uncommon generosity in me or something. Perhaps you have a handful of stories like this as well. Curiously, mine often involve money. I'll share two other money stories later on. The words signs and wonders appear about 200 times in the Bible, many of those in the Old Testament. Interestingly, there are far, far fewer references to the word miracle. I was drawn to read from the second chapter of the book of Acts today because it, is, it was a sign, a wonder, and a miracle that Peter and the others were preaching powerfully and fearlessly only six or seven weeks after Jesus died, and they fled into hiding. In our text, Peter says Jesus' death was no accident, but part of God's plan, as was his rising from death. Now, these early preachers didn't try to explain how Jesus was able to leave the tomb because they didn't know. We still don't know, although the physics of it may be a natural law that we don't have our heads wrapped around yet. They preached what they knew, which was that Jesus had been raised from the dead and that the Holy Spirit he promised had come and would powerfully support anyone who turned their lives over to God. They spoke with such conviction and winsomeness, you heard 3,000 people at a time became believers. Lives and priorities were changed, and a vibrant faith community formed. I was drawn to the phrase signs and wonders because we humans look for signs, signs that things are moving in the right direction, signs that show us which way to go, signs that whichever way we're going, God is with us. And when we sense that God is with us, that we're being guided or comforted or inspired or seen, or that we're enough, that we're loved just the way we are, we feel wonder, gratitude, peace, connectedness with God. We take it as a sign, if not a miracle. Signs and wonders are inspiring and unforgettable events, things we marvel at, wonder about, and might even experience as a bit terrifying, which is why in scripture when angels appear, their first words is typically, fear not, fear not. I don't think we talk much about miracles, almost as if we're embarrassed to use the word. So I've been looking into it, and I'm going to say a little bit more on this topic now. Since you and I are here in worship this morning on person or via Zoom, we probably do believe that miracles happen, but there are lots of people who wonder if that's true. Truth be told, some marvelous events in scripture are just too far-fetched. Humans like to embellish a good story and venerate a good person even more, and sometimes biblical writers did that too. Unfortunately, certain aspects of story in scripture are irrelevant, were irrelevant, unnecessary, and obscured the real Jesus with claims Jesus would never have made for himself. Jesus had miraculous abilities. He was human and divine, but he always attributed miracles to God. He did not perform miracle signs and wonders to win believers or to draw attention to himself, but rather to demonstrate God's love. Sometimes these miracles were also enactments demonstrations of a truth beyond the action and the specific individual involved. One of the most obvious was his healing of physical blindness as a picture of our need to be healed from spiritual blindness. So what is a miracle? One of my favorite authors, Leslie Weatherhead, writes that a miracle is a law-abiding event by which God accomplishes God's purposes through the release of energies which belong to a plane of being higher than man at his present stage of development has reached. Sorry for the non-inclusive language. This was written in 1965. Let's break that down. A law-abiding event. That means a miracle is not, contra 
uh, contrary to universal laws, but rather something that is contrary to what we know in our own stage of development in terms of natural laws. No surprise that God can do things that are new or strange to us, but natural to God. And of course, God's natural laws are not limited to what we can understand with where we are now in our knowledge base. We can't forget that at one time the best minds thought the earth was, round, was flat. And in Jesus' day, no one would have ever considered that it would be possible for humans to walk on the moon. But we've learned the science of space travel. And now, not just astronauts, but regular people, that is, regular people with a lot of money, can go into space. The story of Jairus' daughter is always quoted as Jesus having raised her from the dead. But Jesus said, definitely, she's not dead. Today, we would say Jesus brought her out of a coma. We understand the natural law that people can return that way. Dr. Eben Alexander, a neurosurgeon, went into a coma from which there was almost no hope of returning, let alone returning with faculties intact. intact. But he attributed it in a lecture I heard him give to his son being by his bedside constantly during that coma. What was deemed a miracle that a girl was brought back from the dead is something thankfully common today. Not only do people recover from comas, we have countless stories of near-death experiences where people were literally pronounced dead, no heartbeat, no nothing, and somehow come back. We have countless stories of that. To some people, believing in miracles seems like a huge act of faith, and to not believe in miracles seems like common sense. But as one of my college professors, Robert McAfee Brown, points out in his excellent book called The Bible Speaks to You, the claim miracles cannot happen is just as dogmatic a statement and just as much an act of faith as the claim miracles can happen. The choice then is not of a choice between faith or non-faith. It's a choice between rival faiths. As we think about the biblical story, we can ask if an alleged happening is the kind of thing Jesus would be likely to do. Does it express his compassion and love for people? Healing lepers falls into this category and many, many other things because of Jesus' constant desire to make sick people well. But did he really turn water into 120 gallons of wine at a wedding? This is only recorded in one gospel, and at least 50 years after the event was supposed to have happened. It would have been sensational, but Jesus' motives were always about love, and he did not do startling things for the show of it or to get attention. In fact, he often advised people he healed to go back home but don't tell anybody how they got healed. So we can doubt this particular water into wine story. But here's a fun modern spin on it, as told by Weatherhead in his book, The, Agnostic, the Christian Agnostic. When an old drunkard who had almost sold his home to get money for more and more drink was truly converted, he said a very profound thing. I don't know whether Christ turned water into wine, but for me, he did something that was of much more use. He turned beer into furniture. And the power to change the lives of humans is the real miracle and the heart of Christianity. God became the human man Jesus so we could see that God's true nature is love. And so we could be released from the confines of small, self-centered, anxious lives into lives anchored in God and in love. In 1970, the question on the application for Stanford University prospective students, which had to be answered, was if you could write a book, what would you write about and why? So I said, well, I would write about, um, I would write quotes from famous people, inspirational quotes, and black and white pictures that I would take to illustrate these quotes because I had learned how to do stuff in a dark room at that time and I was just so thrilled. But I said, if I ever come to know that the claims of Christianity are for sure true, I would write a book about God. 
because there would be no more important subject in all the world. To not write about God would be like finding but withholding the cure to cancer. Fortunately, they admitted me. And it was in my first year of college that I started to believe the claims of Christianity as real and true. And to notice signs, wonders, and miracles now and then, which I still remember, and which led to saying to God, my life is yours. Take over, please. Now, of course, that has not meant that I'm on autopilot and God makes all the moves, though many times facing tough decisions, I wished it would have been that way. No, like you, I'm responsible for my choices and my receptivity to God and my receptivity to align with love. But I know God has my back in all things, and no amount of ego, apathy, or error will ever drive God away. I said earlier that I'd share a few more God winks, or what for me have been signs, wonders, and miracles. And interestingly, I've had mem a memorable handful of them related to money, beginning with that $10 bill, but here are two more. In my sophomore year of college, I got it in my head that I wanted to attend a missionary conference in Urbana, Illinois over the Christmas break. Trust me, I had no interest in being a missionary, but I wanted to hear the stories and be inspired, and I knew thousands and thousands of college students attended this thing. My parents graciously said I could cut the short, my Christmas vacation in Connecticut and, and uh, go to this if I came up with the money myself. So I went back to the engineering office as a receptionist over the break, got a small scholarship for the conference, babysat, got a little Christmas money, and I went on the conference. And when I added up the expenses for the conference, including the taxi and some snacks and a book I bought and this and that, and put it next to the amount of money that I had for the conference, it came to the penny. That was even more of a wonder than anything I got out of the conference, the speakers, etc. Just last month, I returned to uh, Stanford for my 45th college reunion. I had prayed in advance, not you know hard and on my knees, but it was just a consciousness that I would have the opportunity to talk with some people on this trip about the Adopt a South African Preschool initiative that uh, most of you know I'm involved with. A handful of people from my freshman dorm attended this reunion. And on the last day, we had lunch together. Partway through lunch, I moved myself and my food around the table to sit next to a guy named Jim, who I hadn't known much during college and certainly had had no contact with since. But we got talking and, you know, what's going on in each other's lives and this sort of thing. And um, when I mentioned Adopt a South African Preschool, he started asking questions. So I took out of my pocketbook what I always carry with me, which is the backside of the flyer from the Nelson Mandela Walk that has information about ASAP. He looked it over and he said, okay, so a preschool hub costs $7,500, verifying what was written on the flyer. And I said, yes, generally about that much. And he said, well, I'm gonna fund a preschool for you. Just 15 minutes of conversation, and six days later, a check for $7,500 arrived in my mailbox. It's part of a larger transfer of funds that will go to the Stella Strat Bank in Pretoria, uh, connected with the church that we're partnered with over there tomorrow. And thanks to Keith, that will happen. This gift from Jim has brought great joy to our ASAP team here and in South Africa because we've wanted to develop a particular hub in an area of great need, and now we have the money to do it. It feels like a small miracle, a sign of being aligned with love, which has become my explicit life intention in recent months. Miracles don't necessarily result in faith, but maybe faith is necessary for them to happen. After all, Jesus said, I can't do miracles in that town because there's no faith there. Do you remember that? I don't know about you, but I go through days, months, even years, when rather than being astounded and excited, I seem to take for granted the miracle of God's love, evident in Jesus and no less real for us today. Signs, wonders, and miracles bump me awake 
to this amazing reality of God with us to the altars in our midst, as, as Bill uh, mentioned earlier. I don't think God is especially interested in getting credit for these things, nor when we share them with others. Is there any room for our taking credit? It's just not about us. But rather, I suspect God might hope we would ask ourselves and each other, wow, if God is real, active, still speaking, accessible, loving us without conditions, what am I, what are we going to do about it? We can't go wrong if our answer to that question is something like, God, I'm moving over. Lead me in a life of love. Let me co-create signs, wonders, and miracles with you. And I think we can't go wrong sharing these stories with others. What if in our time of joys and concerns, we change the wording to joys and concerns, signs, wonders, and miracles? I wonder if we might just begin to look and feel a little more like that community in Acts 2. Amen. And now Bill is going to sing for us as we move toward our ritual of communion together.